Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar titled A Cybersecurity Game Changer How to Better Manage and Control Your Third Party Risk Presented by Healthcare Innovation. My name is Rajiv Leventhal, the Managing Editor of Healthcare Innovation. Today's program is sponsored by SecureLink. Thank you to our sponsor and to our audience for giving us your time and attention today. Before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping details to go over. First, to submit a question for the presenters, please use the Q&A area, uh, please use the Q&A box to the left of your video window at any time. You do not have to wait until the end of the program to submit a question for the Q&A session. And for technical issues, please press F5 to refresh. And if that doesn't work, you can submit a question with your issue through the Q&A panel. Finally, we encourage you to join our conversation on Twitter, and you can tweet using the hashtag HILiveWebinar. At this time, I'd like to introduce our expert speakers for today's program, and we have a great panel for you today. First, we have John Houston, who's the Vice President, Information Security and Privacy, Associated Counsel at UPMC. As a founding member of the Provider Third-Party Risk Management Council, John's accomplishments include establishing effective information security and privacy programs at UPMC, including involvement in a variety of startups, including both a regional health information exchange and cloud-based identity management company. Next up, we have Taylor Lehman, the Chief Information Security Officer at Wellforce. Taylor is a CISO at Wellforce while also being a founding member of the Provider Third Party Risk Management Council. He's been working in information security for uh, privacy and risk for almost 20 years, and he spent his career at PwC's Security Consulting Group and has been a CISO three times over. Third, we have Thomas August, who's the VP and Chief Information Security Officer at John Muir Health. As CISO, Tom has overall responsibility for assessing, measuring, addressing, and reporting on technology risk and compliance matters across the entire health system. Prior to joining John Muir, Tom served in both information security and IT audit leadership roles at Sharp Healthcare, Sony Corporation, Pacific Life Insurance Company, Deloitte, and Ernest & Young. Tom is also a co-author of the CISO Handbook. With that, we are going to kick off today's event with a brief introduction from John and Taylor about the Third Party Risk Management Council before we get into our exciting panel discussion on how to manage and mitigate third party risk. John and Taylor, take it from here, please. Great. Thank you very, very much. Um, maybe the best way to start is to provide some background. And I, I look at my own experience, and, and if I look back to Y2K, probably 95% of the applications that my organization ran were run out of our data center. They're run on-prem. Um, probably almost everything I bought was licensed to, to run on-prem. And there was very little data or workload that was actually in the cloud. I think probably that was the experience of most people. If I look at my organization today, though, um, probably about 75% of what I run is still on-prem, but that's because of the legacy aspect of, of my EMRs and things like that. But probably less than 20%, even maybe even less than that, percent of all the newly acquired applications that we run are run on-prem. Almost everything we're buying now runs in the cloud. In fact, it's rare that I see a software license agreement because most of the time it's some type of SaaS agreement that we that uh, is for delivering services through the cloud. At the same time, I would say not in some form, but at least 100% of my data is in a cloud at least one time, probably more than one time. That's so. That's today. If I fast forward to 2023, so I'm going you know four or five years in advance. I suspect that probably only about 25% of my, my workload will run on-prem. Uh, again, almost nothing I will buy will run on-prem. It will be SaaS applications or some type of um, cloud service, whether it be PaaS or IaaS, whatever. Um, and if there are, are applications that run on-prem, they're probably they're utility in nature, not utilitarian, but utility in nature. 
and and or something I'm using to, to potentially facilitate my my cloud based services. And multiple copies of my data will be in the cloud. And probably when I mean multiple, um, I'm not saying one or two. I'm talking 10, 15, maybe even 20 copies of my data are going to be in the cloud. And it's going to be in various places in the cloud. I don't think there's any uh, option but that. So as a CISO, what's my goal? Um, I look back when everything was on-prem, and I say, you know, I want to at least make sure that my security is as, at least as good as the security that I had when I was on-prem. I don't want less. I shouldn't expect less. I shouldn't have to, uh, you know, I shouldn't have to, to settle for less simply because uh, a vendor or my vendors are, frankly, forcing me to the cloud. But the challenge, I think, that we'll all agree is, is that as we move to the cloud, we as CISOs can't directly secure that information. We now must rely upon others to provide that security. We can provide the oversight, but we can protect, uh, um, directly secure. So, you know, there's a lot of things that we have to do when we decide we're going to, to, to acquire a, a cloud-based services. Obviously, finding suitable suppliers is important. And then trying to, 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 to screen them to make sure that they have that, that adequate security in place, that, that they, we can trust it when we give them our data, that, you know, that uh, we can trust them with it. Then we need to make sure as we're onboarding that we can put those contracts in place to make sure that we get the contractual commitments from those vendors so that they're delivering on what they've agreed to, especially with respect to service and uptime, um, you know, interactive performance, whatever. Uh, and then during that time when we're using that, that service, then we're, there's a lot of work in terms of ensuring we're monitoring performance, make sure that the, the vendor is doing as it says it's going to do. And then how do you deal with the, the situation when you either, because of vendor performance or because you found something better, you need to go to another solution? And how do you deal with things like return of your data, deletion of your data, transitioning from one service to another because your users typically can't, you know, stomach some type of, of, of you know, easy cutover. It take, typically takes some amount of time and effort, and, and so there's a lot involved in that, in that offboarding. And really, if you look at the current approaches, they don't work. Um, I, I look at our own experience, and I have a whole team of people that, you know, we have a difficulty in cooperation from our suppliers. Um, they want to treat it as a black box. During the pre-selection process, you know, we give them our questionnaire with a whole bunch of questions in it. They may respond to it, but that's difficult to assess that, that, that supplier in the context of a questionnaire. Even if you do some level of assessment, very difficult to make sure you know what you're getting. It's difficult because often the vendors don't really want to be forthright with, with this type of information. So it becomes a big game. And then often when we're onboarding, you know, it's difficult to get good SLAs. You know, in my environment, by example, what was an acceptable downtime, you know, we'd expect, uh, you know, three, four, five nines of uptime. I see contracts today where the vendor, you know, the most will agree to is 97 or 96% uptime, maybe 98, but they don't want to go past that. So trying to get good SLAs, trying to make sure we have good recourse. Um, and then during the execution process, you know, we need to make sure we've got good, everything from, from ability to audit and get good information throughout the, that, that relationship. We also, it isn't even stated here, we want to make sure we have good penalties, make sure that if that vendor fails to perform, what is our recourse? And then finally, when we offboard, we need to make sure we have good assurances that we're going to be able to get our data, um, and not just in an electronic format, but in some type of graceful way as we can start to transition off of that service. So really, that's the dance we do today. And I think all of us would agree, boy, I'll tell you, that's difficult, if, if not, and typically not real workable, not a real effective. So with that, I turn it over to Taylor. Hey, cool. Thanks, John. Um, so I, I just wanted to add a little bit to what John had said. Just, and I think he did a nice job of kind of framing, framing the issue. Um, many of us in the healthcare world have dealt with. Um, <clears throat> you know, spending weeks, if not months of time, trying to get a better understanding of our supply chain 
and the uh, folks who sell into it um, for our own security needs. But if you if you step back and look at organizationally, what what is it that we do? In hospital, well, we treat patients, and um, every minute of every day, every every uh, action and activity that we as CISOs do needs to be to contribute to the mission of the of the system. Um, and if you if you look at what John just mentioned, some of these processes, you, you'll find that I, you know, at least I found in my own system and the systems that I've consulted with in the, in the past is that inevitably what we're exchanging for weak due diligence or weak getting to know you constructs, um, we're wasting time, uh, we're wasting effort, we're wasting, we're wasting um, you know, the, the efforts of talented people and we're putting, um, you know, in a sense our operations on hold to treat patients while we go and um, try to assess uh, a third party or a vendor inefficiently. Um, plus, when you really look at the methods that are being used, it's not really much more effort than being done up front in most cases. So some larger systems have figured out and staffed a, you know, a risk-based um, vendor management program, but have done so at a tremendous cost to the organization, which you know, does more than simply assess a vendor up front, but really gets to them um, you know, on a on a and at least the annual basis, or at least goes back and checks to make sure that the vendor is still um, protecting data or its products correctly. But even then, it's it's likely inefficient and probably not enough. Um, you know, healthcare is a high stakes game. Any of our third parties at any point um, could present a existential threat to our organizations. And doing upfront checklists and then maybe once a year check ins. You know, one could argue that that's not always enough. Um, Many cases were, as CISOs, were, were late to the game. Um, you know, many of the processes that we put into place to assess a vendor occur after the vendor's already been selected and the products are already running. Um, you know, and when it's not, you know, the pressure's put on to ab abbreviate that, that work, that due diligence that's super necessary and super critical, um, but it's, you know, put under a, in a time window that really doesn't offer up a thoughtful analysis. Um, and, and frankly, it doesn't scale. Um, I don't. I can't speak for Tom or or John's organizations, but I'll speak for my own. I've got you know 13, 1,400 vendors um, who provide some sort of critical service, require some bit of data, require do operate some component in a cloud or a data center somewhere else, and it's not just what's in the cloud do I need to understand, but it's it's all of those things, and, and it's not just the vendor right having to respond to my questionnaire, but every other hospital system like mine has got their own flavor of that spreadsheet and they're asking that vendor the same question. So n not only does it not scale to cover the 13 or 1400 vendors it needs to, but on the flip side, the vendors are also stuck uh, taking time away from their product development and their, um, their safety and security measures to answer spreadsheets and, and questions. And those processes don't scale either. So if we flip to slide 11, you know, um, we as an industry, uh, took up a, I would say, grassroots is probably the best way to put it. Um, grassroots effort to to come together, understand that these issues happen, not just at our our hospitals, especially the scaling issue, uh, which is the biggest. Um, we work together to come up with uh, really at first a, a shared understanding of the issues. Um, John brought you through the five or six steps in the vendor life cycle. Each of those steps plays a little bit different in our organizations, but we can all agree as CISOs at hospitals, they are all there. And the council, or the third party risk management council was formed about a year ago um, in Pittsburgh, and it was a small group at first. It's grown to about 60 organizations, uh, and we've got uh, large business associates like Nuance, Johnson & Johnson, and Iron Mountain also participating. Council, but really the council's purpose was to come together and form um, a standard set of practices for each step of the life cycle. Um, we are at the beginning stages of this, but our goal with each of those initiatives, and we'll talk about a few of them, we're not done yet, is to bring uniformity and consistency to how our, uh, how our businesses, how our hospitals operate within, say, an onboarding process or a monitoring process or an offboarding process. Because what we found when we talked to, you know, the 70 or 80 hospital systems is we all have the same issues. In most cases, we're solving them in the same ways. Um, and we didn't realize it, but there's a ton of uniform, uniformity and consistency in, in terms of what we're doing, uh, and yet we aren't leveraging each other in that process. Um, we want to reduce the burden also on our organizations from 
from having to facilitate what we traditionally understood to be the supply chain uh, risk management function. So simply put, by working together more um, and reusing and sharing information and adopting common sets of standards, we, we can influence change that reduces the amount of work that not only the providers have to do, but also the vendors, which we think is an important part. Um, Leveraging the power of our network. Um, so again, we, you know, we as healthcare organizations, we we kind of know these issues best. Um, we think that you know every little bit of what Tom might know or what John might know about a certain third party is something that I should be able to reuse and reduce the amount of work that I need to do to figure out what I now need to know. But it doesn't completely elim eliminate it either. And we're working with organizations like High Trust and a few others to uh, help us with uh, uh, bringing attention and awareness and best practices to. How, you know, how we ultimately decide and adjudicate uh, a, a relationship with a vendor. And then finally, uh, you know, getting uh, back to that point earlier, I mean, we don't want to hold up our, our systems from delivering care. Our whole point in, in, in being said at hospitals is to create a safe environment, and that means we have to, have, we have to be able to safely adopt cloud providers and product uh, service companies and, and a variety of other vendors, and our job is to make sure that that process operates at the speed of a hospital, uh, not at the speed of a of, a, of an individual security practitioner. And then finally, you know, we, back to that point around grassroots, you know, we really think that it's important that the industry here solve this issue. We've been waiting for vendors, excuse me, we've been waiting for regulators to do it for years. Um, the vendors, that, regulators have put out a lot of guidance. I think we've filled in uh, a pretty healthy marketplace for third party assessments and audits and work that, you know, certainly organizations are getting rich off of, but hospitals are still suffering um, from from uh, some of the inefficiency of those 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 uh, those marketplaces create, and we want to solve it. We think we're in the best position to do it. So the council, like I said, the council was formed about a year ago. We started with six. We're up to over 60. Um, so this uh, this diagram is a little. It's not out of date. It, it does conform to the governing council, but um, we have. Uh, begun to take, we've, we've actually made two large recommendations to the industry about uh, general best practices for onboarding. Uh, we've also built a risk rank model for determining the appropriate level of assurance and oversight for a given vendor. Um, obviously, working with like a Cerner or an Epic, given the access to data they might have, might be greater than the mom and pop shop down the street. But I can speak for pretty confidently for everybody on this call that each of our hospital systems has those situations and we need to do business with them, and, and our jobs is to find out ways to do that. And so the council today has put together you know, a handful of, and we'll be pr producing more and more uh, recommended guidance for the, for the council, the, the 60 plus community behind it to adopt. Uh, you can learn more about the council. There's a website, it's called the provider-tprm.org, uh, where we publish almost all of our stuff. Uh, and we've been putting a lot of work into getting out there at conferences and doing webinars like this to sort of push and get input and turn around best practices where they're needed. Um, but as you can see from the council's makeup, we've got community health systems, we've got academic medical centers, we've got world-class um, world class organizations like Cleveland Clinic, UPMC, uh, Mayo Clinic, Tufts, University of Rochester, others. Um, High Trust has been a super supporter of ours. They've given us access to resources and expertise in their house, and they're, they've been providing us, uh, you know, basic advice and, and, and their years of experience doing third-party risk. But we've also got a number of inputs from large GPOs like Yankee and Premier, uh, large physician groups. We're working directly with all the largest HIT vendors out there, uh, including Cerner, including Epic, to bring, to bring them to the table as well. Um, I expect the next wave of things for us to do is, is focusing on how to integrate more real-time monitoring into an oversight and management process for third parties, as well as uh, getting deeper into how do we actually uh, come together and affect product security. It's been a hot topic. Same sort of construct exists with vendors all sort of, or excuse me, with the providers like ours all doing very similar things. Um, ultimately, our goal is to use this uh, council as a way of influencing the industry. And, and really, and the best example I can give is um, helping organizations who may not really have the wherewithal or bandwidth to help themselves. You know, I think about the, the you know, 100-bed hospital in the town I grew up in. There's no way that they had a sophisticated IT department that could do security assessments for vendors. And yet, this program, if, if we're successful, 
um, gives those gives those small community hospitals the ability to adopt a set of standards and basically ask for and demand the same level of security that UPMC and Tufts Medical Center would demand uh, at no cost, at no with no binding obligation necessarily to, to do it that way. But um, frankly, if we can push uh, our third parties to be more secure and more stable and, and understand that if they can meet the level of security at UPMC requires that they can meet the level of security that Tufts and Mayo and Cleveland do as well. Um, I think we not only help those small community systems and, and physicians organizations, um, whether or not they're even aware of high trust, the fact that they're in an industry now with some leadership around this topic is huge. Um, for those that are, we can help them streamline their supply chain processes. And, and, and as I said before, for vendors and third parties, look, they spend a lot of money, they spend a lot of time trying to get their houses in order and meet their customers' needs. I think we're doing everyone a favor by simply announcing, you know, hey, there are some standards that our organizations adopt, and if you come to our organization with these standards met, um, you will not necessarily jump over the security assessment process. There's still a getting to know you thing that we need to do. Uh, but we will make this at least one part of it a lot easier and a lot simpler and, and frankly, in my opinion, more safe. Finally, um, the, the council just of itself, before we jump to questions, the council has four constructs, um, the governing board, which is um, that those organizations on the, the previous slide, uh, our job is to create programs and facilitate dialogue across the industry to develop guidelines and basically advocate and outreach. I mean, our organizations are independently funding this. I, I think the website's still on my personal credit card. Uh, we, don't, we don't accept payment. No one's giving us anything other than what our organizations are putting on the table. So, um, you know, there, we, our, our goal is impartiality and to be a governing board member, even to be in, involved in it, you know, we, we expect that of our, of our participating organizations. Um, the participants, these are organizations who believe in what we're trying to do and want to join up. And for folks who are interested in being a participant, uh, we have a welcome packet on our website, which can be used to understand and train all parts of the organization, not just security, but the supply chain, the legal, um, the HR, the biomed, you name it, it's in there. Uh, we've, we've done a good job of, I think, putting together some materials that make joining the council very actionable. Um, similarly, we are working with our vendors. Um, you know, we didn't, we didn't mention it, but uh, the goal of the council is by 9-1 of 2020, all of our vendors will be uh, aligned with our, excuse me, all of our vendors who receive electronic patient health information uh, or PHI in any form will be aligned to our to our standards, and that means maintaining a certification by 9-1 of 2020, uh, or at least committing to have it addressed in that time. Um, and you can read about these commitments on our website. But um, one of the things that's really important for us go governing council is we are all holding our vendors to the standards and guidelines of the council today. Uh, we have we are working towards and expecting full compliance in our supply chains by the end of next year. Uh, and we're very well on our way. In fact, um, I, my, my last count is every new vendor we brought on, every new third party we brought on in the last six months is conformant with our guidelines. Uh, and, I, and I think the feedback I've gotten has been uh, from the vendors and partner communities that's very positive and very helpful and thankful that we've come together with a message that helps them clarify what they need to do to make their, uh, make their customers happy. Um, and then high trust, high trust, as I mentioned, provides advice and counsel when, when necessary. Uh, we've been working with some of the folks in their standards organization to come up with some kind of open source sharing of information and access to some of the back end information that they keep uh, that, so that we can offer it to council members at no charge. So that is the council and that's who we are. And those are kind of a brief overviews of what we're doing and, and the key points. Um, and uh, Rajiv, I think it's, it's back to you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, uh, uh, John and Taylor, for uh, you know providing some of the the details and clarity behind the council and, and the work that it's been doing on the grounds. Um, now we'd like to bring our uh, begin our panel discussion with our three cybersecurity experts, uh, John, Taylor, and Tom. And in talking to these industry leaders offline, I'm, I'm confident this will be a a terrific conversation. Uh, before we start, I'd like to remind you once again that you can use the Q&A box to the left of your video window at any time to submit a question. Uh, so, you know, based on what John and uh, Taylor described right there, uh, talking about some of the risks, you know, I'd like to start with looking at the, the 30,000 foot view. Uh, as a whole, how would you guys characterize the current state 
of provider organizations approaches to third party risk management? Are we talking about uh, most uh, general maturity or lack of maturity on a one to 10 scale, maybe with one being totally lackluster and, and 10 being totally mature, what would you guys say? And, and I'd love to hear your individual specific experiences. And uh, we, we could kick it off with, uh, with Tom from, from John Muir Health. You know, Tom, what, what do you think about the, the overall state of maturity here? Yeah, thank you. And I really appreciate uh, the commentary earlier. I think it's a really exciting opportunity. Um, that the, the guys were talking over. I think when I look at the industry uh, in healthcare, um, it surprises me how much variety there is. There are some organizations that are highly mature, they have very robust processes for vetting third parties, very strong governance organizations that they can run risk through. Other organizations don't have much at all, and there's a small minority, I think, are still in the doctor no kind of mindset, where the security officer just says no, and they kind of just do it. Um, those aren't really effective. I think that's going down over time. So I think it's a wide range. Um, I think the really good ones, they, they understand the business and they partner with the business because uh, they understand that all new technology implementations are to enable business. And I think the ones that struggle the most are the ones that aren't aligned with business and are either at odds or avoiding it. Great. John and Taylor, any thoughts on, you know, uh, 1 to 10 scale, the, the general state of maturity here? Yeah, I, let me, uh, I'll add my two cents worth. I, I think it, it's interesting, I think especially as we go to the cloud, um, the, what the vendors think they are and what we think they are are often two different things. I think our vendors would all like you to think that they have a high level of maturity uh, around their um, about their programs and we should simply trust them. And then I think providers um, feel very uncomfortable with the way that their their suppliers are, are, are uh, their transparency maybe is a way to say that. At the end of the day, I think, you know, based upon the current model, when I even have it in my organization, you know, I'm, uh, no matter how hard I push my vendors to give me good good information and be transparent and make good commitments, I'm still you know, fairly low on that, that scale. I mean, I hate to put a number at it, but, you know, at best it's a, you know, a three maybe. Um, I think our approach is to try to get us to a six or a seven, knowing that, boy, total, being really, really mature, is a, that, that would take teams of people and enormous amounts of effort and time. And I, I'll be happy to move up to a seven and, and feel good about it, knowing I'm, I'm working really hard at it today and not getting very far. Taylor? Yeah, I, so I, I mean, I think you guys have some pretty astute points on, on both sides. Um, I think for me it's um, it, the relative state of maturity is defined by the way we do it today. So that slide, John, you went through on the, um, you know, the progression through the vendor life cycle. Yeah, I think I think in, if, if we're saying like perfection in that model is the goal, then I'd say we're probably all operating around a four or a five. Um, you know, maybe the really well-resourced organizations can, can deal with the, the throughput requirements or have the bandwidth to deal with the, you know, the amount of stuff tracking through there uh, as possible. But even, even still there, like, I question whether we get even, like, good value and action out of those processes. I mean, I think in many cases we're still just checking the box. Um, and, you know, I, I won't speak for you, but I will say it, it has been in my experience that that is what, um, I, what comes to mind first is like that process and the manual nature of it and the way we've been going about it has been very much in the mindset of just getting it done um, and shoveling the you know what as quickly as possible. Um, I think we need to change the paradigm. So I would argue that there's a, probably a maturity model of working together more, sharing data and collaborating across the healthcare ecosystem. Um, that I think that's the, the maturity model we need to sort of define and then move ourselves up. Um, but I'd say within, the, if we if we agree the construct is as we've laid out earlier, then I would say we're pretty we're probably pretty low on it. Um, and I don't think we move up until every action we take actually has a positive patient or mission outcome. Um, right now, all of the mission outcomes we're, we're seeking seem to be compliance only, and um, seem to be simply getting stuff getting work done. They don't seem to really be about making patients safe or being more compliant. They 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 really don't. Are you yeah, what's that? What's that old saying? You know, are you what, what, um, 
This is no, I'm sorry, go ahead. speaking on behalf of all of healthcare, or are you just looking from your own health system's experience? Because my experience is far different than yours. Um, I would say um, uh, part of it is influenced uh, having spent 10 years at PwC working with companies trying to put these in. And I've seen some really great ones, and I think that there's organizations that have got this nailed and are doing awesome and really are getting value. I'd say by far and large, there, there's, there's, there are fewer of those than there are um, folks who are struggling mightily with this. And so I was, I, was, I was kind of stepping back thinking, you know, if you were asking me kind of on an industry basis how I would view it, I'd say it's largely informed through working through, you know, 100 or so of these organizations in a consulting capacity. And now being in a hospital system for about two years and kind of looking across the, you know, the, not just what we have here in Boston as far as the system I'm responsible for, but what I see broadly in the market um, and, and obviously through this TPRM initiative. Um, I, I, again, I see those pockets of excellence, and, but I, I do see a lot more confusion. And I, and I do think, like I said, I, I, think the, I think the model that I would advocate we shoot for, from my personal opinion, is one of much more collaboration, um, it, which I think will change the way all of this looks, I guess is what I'm saying, if, if we can get there. Tom, I'd, I'd love to, you know, direct this next question to you because, uh, you know, as we've spoken about, you've taken the lead on building uh, some third-party vendor risk management programs in the past for multiple organizations. And, and going back to, you know, the last question and some of the responses, I, I did see a recent industry report that re revealed that uh, something like 56% of provider organization respondents uh, experienced a vendor or third-party breach and that about a quarter of the vendors assessed in the report represented either a medium or a high risk to the healthcare organizations to which they're contracted. So, uh, you know, you've been on the ground doing some, some great work here. Can you offer, you know, uh, an example or two, an anecdote of what those processes were like when you uh, developed those programs and how things turned out? I, I think, you know, few people are, are, are better apt to, to speak about this than you. Well, that's a hell of a tee up. Thank you. Um, so <laughs> I, I totally agree. It's, I think the, the big mantra that I have is collaborate, don't dictate. I think if you're in a security organization, you really it, it's really easy to take the high the high horse and dictate that, oh, it's unsecure, we can't do it. And, and we all know that's not really the answer the business needs. So being collaborative, um, I, I think that is like job one for anybody in the security office is to work very closely um, with the business. In fact, one of the best compliments I've gotten recently at work was somebody that, um, when I was trying to explain where my office was, oh, that's your office? Well, I never see you in it. Perfect. That means I'm doing my job. I'm out and I'm in with the business. I'm at the hospitals. I'm at the clinics. I'm, I'm working with all of our stakeholders, uh, the program. So that means we're doing good work. So that said, um, one of the things we do, I think step one was to really understand the risk appetite of the organization. Some organizations are very um, risk averse. Some organizations aren't. They'll accept risk. They're very aggressive. And most are somewhere in between uh, where they want to manage risk in some effective level. But I think as a security person running the risk assessment process, you really need to know kind of what the level of the organizational risk tolerance is. I think that's job one. Um, and then don't just think of it as one point in time because it changes during times uh, different times over, over the years. Um, an organization may fluctuate from being very risk averse and then all of a sudden um, business gets tight, you know, margins get tight, they may be open to a little more risk and may be willing to accept more risk. So just be aware of that, that does fluctuate over time. Um, and then for each initiative, it's really interesting. You guys are talking about um, cloud. And my own experience is nearly all of the initiatives that we see that are brought to us, um, don't involve the cloud. And no contract can be signed without me seeing it. We're, we're butted right into the contract uh, approval um, process here uh, for any type of contract, whether it's OPERI, OPEX or CAPEX. So I see pretty much everything coming through, and almost all of ours are tied to something physical on our network, whether it's a medical device, an application system that at least has a client on it at the, at the desktop, or something. So while there's some of them have cloud backends or some other third-party connection. Um, I think a lot of them still have an on-prem piece to it. So getting to, you know, what other things we look at is then we have to understand how that impacts our business. 
what are the data flows that actually happen on our business, which might be different than yours? Who's going to run it? And is that understood by all the people that are running it? What are the responsibilities associated with that? Um, understanding the actual data flows within the organization and as it leaves your perimeter to go out to other parties and understanding where the control points are. Um, once it hits a cloud, they may have a, a vetted security platform, but you don't know that. So of course, then you go into the security questionnaire type thing. But ours, we don't treat it as a security questionnaire. It's really a technology risk evaluation where we're looking at database integrity and integration, networking, um, application support, service desk support, all the things that really enable a technology. Well, we review all of that uh, as part of our process. It usually takes us about two weeks to complete one of these uh, overall. Um, we generally don't take, un unless the vendor is unresponsive or something, we generally don't have a problem with it. And then we just escalate it up through the senior leader that's sponsoring it, and we usually get turnaround pretty quick on them answering our questions. I haven't had a lot of problems with vendors being evasive because I know how to escalate, and I'm not afraid to get on the phone or get my peers on the phone and we will get them uh, moving because they want to sell us a product at the end of the day. So it's just a matter of finding the right lever to get them motivated to want to um, get something uh, completed for us. So I can keep going, but I think that's a good introduction. Yeah, that's that's great, Tom. And I, I want to direct this next question as kind of a follow-up to John and, and Taylor. From your guys' uh, perspectives and your respectives or, or respective organizations at, at UPMC and, and Wellforce, uh, you know, finish this sentence. The organizations or your organization, uh, you know, have, has been able to find the most effective risk, risk management programs do blank. What, what uh, you know, is that secret sauce? What is that, uh, you know, recipe that, that you can recommend that you have seen from your experience, uh, you know, that, that works in terms of mitigating that, that third-party risk? I'm going to go back to another. Uh, go ahead, Taylor. No, no, no. John, please. I'm going to go back to a, a, a uh, gentleman that works for me who is an ex-Marine who said, uh, you have to exercise relentless dis um, discipline and consistency. And I think that that involves everything that Tom just said as well, which is um, you, you, you have to make sure that um, you, you don't allow a vendor to gain control of your process. You have a process that's there for a reason. Um, the, the process ensures that um, you're able to identify, um, measure, mitigate risk to your organization. And the first time you allow that vendor to, to, to grasp control over, of your process or circumvent your process, you, you've, you've lost. So, uh, you know, you have to, to be consistent. You have to be disciplined. Um, and you have to demand that any vendor that wants to do business with you do the same. Um, I'll add to to this, I'm going to steal some of both of your thunder here, but I, I think um, I think Tom made a really important, well, two really important points. Um, one is um, organizations, to me, to, to answer the question, organizations you found are the most fresh risk management programs, they do spend time defining what is risky and what isn't. Um, right, that whole con discussion around risk appetite um, is really important, and I think it's overcomplicated in, in many in many respects. I've, I've worked at a large international bank, and we had a quantitatively driven risk appetite. Um, you know, I mean, it's it's you know, I think we it's often many of us, uh, myself included, still some days that I, I kind of scratch my head on well, what is what is risk appetite? Is it is it expressed through outcomes? Is it expressed through financial dollars? Is it Compliance, but I think there's I think organizations that do talk about risk taking and document when they take risk and when they don't find themselves to have more you know, effective risk programs because they they spend time to understand their appetite. I would say the other thing that I found most important for third party risk management, especially for the security function, is to as Tom also said, like get out from behind your desk and go see how the sausage is made. Um, you know, if you have a question about how a product is being used or how something interacts with a different piece of technology so that you can properly understand the risk it poses to your organization, you, you need to get out and talk to the people who actually use the darn thing. Um, watch them work. See what they do and then talk to them about it. It will make your uh, understanding of risk and risk taking much more informed. Um, 
and I, I think that's really important. And I don't think it's inclined. I mean, I don't want to speak for the industry. I think in general, technologists are introverts and probably would be more comfortable sitting at their desk than not. Although uh, that I'm, I realize I'm painting the world with a broad brush there. So don't quote me on it, but I, I would say um, it, it's, it's not unnatural to want to do that. And yet we have to force ourselves to get out and see the business and learn from it in real time. So I think those are, two things that organizations who have really effective risk programs do. And then I think to, to John's point, you know, um, and this is where this gets hard is um, we, we need to be un uncompromising. Um, yes, we need to be flexible, but we, we do need to understand that within a certain risk appetite, we, our job is to be uncompromising. Um, and that, that doesn't mean we have to be the no people, but I do think um, understanding where our uh, or for security to understand where its job ends and where business risk and business risk taking begin is an important place and not all security risk is necessarily dumped on the security organization to manage you know ultimately it's business risk and the business needs to be accountable for it and at the end of the day the two sides may disagree um, but i do think it's important that organizations who have strong risk management programs understand that the risk ultimately at the end of the day is a business risk and it needs to be managed by the business and, and not necessarily by security. I think those three things are really important. I really like the, the last point you raised is so spot on. I think that's one of the reasons why we're successful here is that not everybody passes our risk assessment. In fact, most don't, but we have a good governance organization. It runs very smoothly and I can escalate issues up to the right level of leadership to determine whether or not those business risks are worth it. And it's not for me to decide. I mean, I'm a vice president, sure, but uh, we bring it up to the VPs and SVPs across the entire organization. And they make the decisions that are most appropriate for the organization. My job is just to shine a flashlight on it and tease out all the facts and then let them make an educated business decision. So I really appreciate it. your Your last point was just hit really hit home for me. Yeah, I, the one point, though, I would like to make in sort of response to what Tom just said is one of the challenges that we also find is, is that many of our business leaders are willing to accept risk because risk in the abstract is easy to accept. And then when something happens, they're often the same people that will turn around and say, well, who, who agreed that to that? And so hard, part of, I think, the challenge with respect to risk is also getting business leadership to also appreciate what that risk really means and, and making sure that when they do accept risk or um, that they really do it in a way that's informed and um, has an eye towards the fact that if it, that it very well may manifest itself. So let's unpack that, right? So you have a risk assessment and let's say I've got, I'm gonna just pick up, let's say I have a, a cardiology device, right? And it's gonna have a certain amount of patient records that are going to be going on that device on a daily basis. Well, I can annualize that number. So I can pretty much estimate within a reasonable proximity how many records there are going to be and what's the nature of the data that's on it. And then if I understand the data flows and the mitigations that may exist or our recommendations for rec mitigations that we're going to talk about it to some extent. And we can talk about, okay, where could it be compromised? Where could it be um, either stolen or altered or something like that, and what would that risk look like? And we can quantify it to some degree. It's not a mathematical thing, it's definitely subjective, but it, it is more of an educated conversation on risk than just, ooh, it's scary. And, <laughs> no, know, no, but, and, and, but and, excuse me, but we, we, and we do do that all the time, just what you described. It, it still, it still comes, can be a very difficult conversation for, for, for people to completely uh, quantify the risk in a way that, that makes sure that they're making the, the best decision. Because I, I go through the same math all the time. Yeah, my experience is different. That's all. Great. Moving on to you know some of the, our, our for the next question. Um, when you look at some of the uh, challenges, uh, I, I think it was Tom or, or somebody mentioned that you know you, of course you are contracting here with the vendors and uh, usually you know they're kind of on board with everything. But you know have you guys experienced uh, you know challenges in getting vendors to accept the the changes that are being made, or is that you know more of a non-issue? Uh, Tom, your thoughts? Sure. So not everybody meets um, our risks, our, our risk mitigation strategies on day one. Sometimes they may not be ready yet. And 
we work with the business to see, okay, well, is it something they're willing to commit to in a reasonable time frame? Are they showing progress towards meeting our risk expectations over a period of time? Like, for example, if it's a cloud-hosted thing, I'm looking for a SOC 2 audit report, not just of the platform, but also the application system that sits on top of the platform and the business operations for that. If they don't have that ready yet, is that something they're currently working on, or are they going to uh, complete within, say, 30, 60, 90 you know, days or something like that. If so, can we get that written into the contract um, to have them commit to having that done at a point in time? We've had great success with that. Um, we've gone out, it depends on the nature of what it is. Um, we've gone out with the vendor contract to say it, it can be up to six months, but we don't send data out until they're substantially towards that goal. So we won't test with live data. We'll still use like, you know, fake data and stuff that's completely, you know, uh, has no uh, bearing on, on real patients. But that said, um, you know, we've definitely worked with them and we've had good success, but I think it really comes down to getting the right sponsorship engaged in the conversation. Um, if they have the guy cutting the check on the phone with the vendor, they are going to be responsive. I think the security teams that struggle with that are the ones that don't have the right relationships to make that happen internally. But uh, we've had good success here, whether it's with me or the CFO or the chief nursing officer or whoever. Um, on the phone with some of our vendors, they, they've definitely come around. Yeah, that's, that's great perspective. Uh, John Taylor, any any comments on you know getting vendors yeah. to accept uh, you know some of these these changes? These uh, you know is, is it in uh, uh, something that that needs adaptation or or not really in your experience? Um, I would say that uh, it's a dialogue. It to be expected. I think the the biggest challenge that we've uh, I, I think there's I think there's two things that positively influence outcomes in that space um, yes it's you know no one no one loves to go to the doctor and and no one loves to see you know uh, what, what what they're sick with or what I mean maybe you do I don't, know, I don't. Um, but you know no one wants to be told that they need to go take this new medication for, for something right um, in the same sense vendors don't like to be uh, told that yet they have to complete these forms or and you know that some new certification is required or some new contact language that disadvantages them um, in, in general again broad brush right I want to be careful about um, exacting language but I, I would say two things help one is being clear years before a vendor uh, wants to do business with you so that the vendor knows what your expectations are if they're learning what your expectations are um, after they drop the contract off and fill out your form, then I'd say that's years too late. So the more you can do education and being upfront and advertising what your needs are, I think those help. And then I think the second is being realistic about how long it might take for a vendor to, you know, be able to comply with what you need. I, I think Tom made a good point. I mean, it's a dialogue, right? And it takes time. No one's perfect out of the gate. Our goal is to create more, you know, better situations to start from when a negotiation, but not necessarily to eliminate any of that dialogue entirely um, but I but I think that that's helpful and then I I'd say the third thing I, I should have said there were three but I think the third thing is um, you know sh these things called shared fate metrics um, we probably don't use them enough but um, we want to incentivize success not failure so how do we do that in terms of a service level agreement or you know as a way of negotiating through a compromise how do we uh, uh, through a, excuse me through a, through an issue with the contract or contract terms, how do we find a way that both organizations get what they need and then incentivize good behavior right so maintaining a compliance level um, maybe that is a two percent increase uh, I mean this is just throwing it out there, but maybe that maybe that could open up the dialogue for uh, negotiating an increase in, in in funding for security the vendor side or or failure, uh, downtime, an issue, maybe that's a financial penalty that's exacted in small bits to incentivize the vendor to fix the issue. You know, I think creative contracting terms like that um, really do provide an opportunity to, um, you know, soften some of what are otherwise hard edges when it comes to um, contracting and negotiating with vendors to get them to kind of, of the place where you want them to be. Yeah, well, yeah. well said, everybody. Yeah, no, quick, quick thoughts. Uh... Before we move on, yeah, I, the one thing I'd like to add to what Taylor said, to be more, maybe more blunt, is some one of the things that that um, the, the council has put in place is some model uh, legal provisions, and one of the things that we're doing with our vendors is is around penalties. 
is if you put penalty provisions in place in order to, to, to get to compliance and maintain compliance, um, sometimes that can be the effective and you know, it's the, the carrot and the stick. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's unfortunate. You've, you've got to get to the point where you, you get the vendors to, to, a, uh, to a position where you feel comfortable with their, with their overall risk management and, and security, things like that. But then you need to keep them there. And, you know, and, and unfortunately, especially some of the major uh, relationships that we have, and I'm sure Tom and Taylor have as well, you know, what happens if the, the vendor starts to fail? Um, these relationships are, it, it will, are very complex. The, the, the solutions are very complex. The ability to move from solution to solution, you sometimes are very, very limited. Um, and it's, it's difficult. It would take a year or more to, 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 to change solutions. And, and, you know, in some environments, you know, m many millions of dollars to, to do so. So um, there has to be a way to, to, to incentivize vendors to become compliant or main, ensure that they're compliant at the beginning of the relationship and maintain that compliance throughout the, the, the relationship. Um, or maybe not, maybe I shouldn't be even speaking of compliance, but maintain that level of performance throughout the, 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 the you know, the, the relationship so that, you know, we're not dealing with a, a bad vendor situation. Yeah, all, all terrific perspectives, and this is a, a, a great discussion. The the hour is flying by. Unfortunately, we have to move on to, to the next part, and we couldn't even get through all of our, our panel questions. But this was really uh, uh, this was really insightful and, and a great learning uh, experience. I'd like to turn uh, over the presentation quickly uh, to uh, Justin Strachany from SecureLink. He's SecureLink's chief customer officer who has – uh, a, a couple of, of comments to make, and then hopefully we'll get to uh, the Q&A for at least a few questions. Uh, Justin, you're, uh, it's all yours. Thanks, Rajiv, and thank you, everyone, for a really great dialogue. It was nice to see and hear so many different perspectives. Um, at SecureLink, this is a topic that's near and dear to us as we work with many hospitals and other security-conscious industries facing the challenge of reducing network security risk while maintaining the balance of relationships with employees and vendors that are so critical to maintaining efficient operations and patient health. So as vendors are increasingly relied upon to manage these complex systems, any increase in security has to be balanced against that need to uh, ensure efficient support resolution, um, and one of the most challenging things is not overwhelming uh, resources that may already be fully utilized to implement new security workflows and policies. Um, and of course, any improvements in security in a perfect world uh, don't come at the expense of operational efficiency. Typically at SecureLink, we see uh, the actual implementation of these key frameworks uh, manifest themselves in three key areas. The first, identifying vendors. We all know that shared accounts need to be avoided at all costs. Anytime a privileged credential is shared, it increases the risk that it can be stolen and, and at minimum removes accountability for that access. But the task of identifying the third-party users is really complicated. Vendors can have dozens or even hundreds of ever-changing employees, and authentic authenticating them can require obtaining regular spreadsheets of users or manually adding them in Active Directory, which is much more difficult than the task of managing internal users. Next, uh, VPNs and desktop sharing technologies have a tendency to grant 24 by 7 access to your entire network, even when vendors may only need access to a few servers. So in addition to the risks of exposing unnecessary access, Many of us may have dealt with the frustration of vendors upgrading the wrong server at the wrong time because there weren't sufficient controls on that access. Unfortunately, uh, implementing those controls can involve complex virtual networks or firewall rules, et cetera. Finally, changes in regulatory compliance have brought additional audits, and with them the need to provide regular reports of who accessed certain systems, ideally down to the individual. Gathering this information can involve digging through system event logs, firewall records, if it's even possible. 
Uh, ideally, uh, we want something that can allow us to easily report on which individuals may have accessed a privileged system for deeper forensics during the last 30 days, either regularly or in response to some sort of event. So SecureLink is built from the ground up to automate and enforce these security best practices. We're the only solution specifically designed for third-party uh, privileged access, especially in healthcare where we work within uh, six of the top 12 HCI technology vendors and three of the top four U.S. health systems. In addition to the technology, we leverage over 15 years of experience partnering with our customers to establish holistic best, best practices across the entire vendor life cycle with consulting services architected by a certified third-party risk professional. We've created a thorough compendium that we've dubbed the ultimate guide to third-party remote access. If you'd like a copy or would like to talk to one of our experts about any particular third-party security challenges, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Justin. And I would like to get to uh, one or two questions. A, a bunch have come in, so, so clearly a, a, a very relevant topic for our attendees. Uh, this one from, from a research hospital is more and more services have moved to the cloud. Uh, we've started to encounter some difficulty working with those vendors which are smaller in scale and may or may not have the resources to digest our legal security uh, addendum and, and or provide us with a SOC 2 Type 2. Uh, what's your experience in working to secure contracts requested by the business, but these vendors do not have the internal resources to meet these security requirements? Uh, interesting question, I thought. Tom, you want to take a stab at that? Sure. We just had one of these about uh, a week and a half ago. Um, you see this a lot in healthcare with registries. If you have to share um, population health information with uh, any of the entities that, that you're associated with. Um, they're two or three person organizations, so they don't always have the best control environment, but you're almost dictated um, to use them. So in that case, we have escalated those up through governance and just explained very clearly, this is what we're doing, here's everybody that's playing in that space, here's who's asking for it, here's why they're asking for it, and here's what we're able to ascertain, and more importantly, here's what we don't know. And in many cases, we don't know much about their IT infrastructure at all, um, but at least we can articulate what we do know and, and what the potential risks could be. We'll try to implement some mitigating factors as best we can, but sometimes you just can't, um, especially with the registries that you're being dictated uh, you know, um, to use. So yeah, that's, that's a spot on question. I hope that answer makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. John Taylor? Yeah. Um Actually, we deal with this on a fairly regular basis, and I'll tell you one of the strategies I have and is I often question the the business uh, owner as to whether we can afford to do business with that vendor. Uh, if the vendor is too small, and when you do the risk, the risk uh, calculus and you decide that your potential risk far outweighs the or, or out costs the what the, the that vendor can can potentially afford to absorb, um, maybe you need to find another vendor that's more, more, more able to, 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 to cover the risk um, and have the programs in place to secure your data. And we have walked away from um, deals with small vendors because we just didn't feel like they had the, the, the wherewithal, both technology and financially, to, to deal with the risk that um, doing business with my organization potentially um, um, you know, caused. Great. I, I think with that, we have to wrap up. I wish we could answer all of uh, the attendees' questions, but unfortunately, we only have an hour. Um, that's what happens when you have such a robust discussion, which I uh, believe that we did have. I'd like to once again thank uh, John, Taylor, and Tom for a really informative presentation, uh, three uh, of the industry's top cybersecurity experts joining us today. And I'd also like to thank our sponsor, SecureLink, for making today's program possible. And finally, I'd like to thank you, everyone in our audience, for joining us today. We really do hope you'll join us in the future for another Healthcare Innovation Webinar. This concludes today's presentation. <laughs>